Yard. How you doing? Good, Becca. The offspring. How's it going, Becca? Dave Grohl. How you going, mate? Good, man. Pete, it's been a long time coming. Oh, Becca, hasn't it indeed? We go inside the dressing room, speak to the biggest names in music. Keith Richards, the Rolling Stones. And crack open their esky. This is exactly how I imagined you, by the way, sitting opposite me with a vodka and orange. You're a discerning chap. This is The Rider. Welcome back to The Rider, and we're all very excited about Midnight Oil's brand new album and their final album, Resist, which is out now, their 13th and final chapter of the band. Uh, it's a farewell to the band, a farewell as well to Bones Hillman, who we lost last year. And the last couple of weeks, we've been pretty excited about the release of all these new songs. And in fact, last week, a track-by-track track special podcast went up on Spotify only, of the writer and uh, includes Pete Garrett and Rob Hurst and their thoughts on the album and the lead up to the recording of this final album with Midnight Oil. You can get it right now on Spotify. Click subscribe and uh, listen to the album track by track uh, and the stories behind them. But look, this album starts off with an incredible track, Rising Seas, which was the first single. And this is the one the fans are all saying is their personal pick. The Barker Darling River. And two years ago, if you were at that uh, famous gig at Anita's and Thoreau, which was like a warm up gig for that tour, which was about to go right around the world, uh, the Great Circle Tour, you would have heard this song for the very first time. Tarkheim. Throughout the Great Circle Tour and, of course, uh, the first couple of gigs in Tassie, they have premiered a whole bunch of songs live and also brought back a bunch of songs they hadn't performed um, in a very, very long time. This is the title track from the album Resist. Only we resist. Midnight Oil's final album, Resist, is out now and I'm very happy to have a chat with uh, the drummer of the band and he's an absolute legend. He's one of the fittest blokes you'll ever see on stage. Rob Hurst, the drummer of Midnight Oil. He's just dialing in right now on Zoom. There he is. Rob Hurst, how are you? I'm well, Becca. How are you going? Mate, I'm doing well. It's so good to see your face. It's been uh, a while. I think the Hunter Valley was the last time I saw your face in, in person from a distance. But um, <laughs> hey. Yeah, my face looks better from a distance. Thank you. <laughs> Mate, how do you do it after all these years? I mean, you've got to be one of the fittest blokes I've ever seen on stage. I'm being driven along by our new bass player, Becca, Adam Ventura. And he's been great. That was the first time I saw him was yeah. uh, at that show. So we've, we've already done four shows in Tasmania on the Resist Tour, uh, all outdoor shows. And uh, I think by the end of it, the show in Hobart on the Mona lawns there, the museum lawns were, that last one, it really felt like we were locking in again and um, can't wait to play the rest of the tour now. I'm having a particularly great time playing with Adam Um as part of that rhythm section with Midnight Oil, it's really joyful. And uh, his playing reminds me a little bit of the way Peter Gifford, Giffo used to play as well. So it's, in a way, it's kind of back to the 80s and, and 90s period with, um, with, with our rhythm section. I'm, I'm having a great time. And that's the thing I love about how you support each other. Because I was watching that gig, how um, it was—he was still the, the well and truly the new guy at that point. And uh, you know the communication between you two, and and also the support from the crowd. I think everyone just just really uh, wanted to see it all work, and it and it did. It was it was a great moment. Yeah, it's 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 great when it locks in again. You feel okay, we're back. And um, he's um, poor guy. His head must be exploding. He's had to learn upwards of 75, 80 songs. You know, we've got a catalogue now of over 200 published songs. So it's a big ask. But, and they're not easy songs, as you know, Becca. You know, yeah. they're, uh, they change gear four or five times during, and, you know, when there should be twos and fours, there's, you know, lots of threes. And, and then, of course, Adam is also determined to sing lots of parts as well. Although, having said that, we do have uh, the magnificent voices of Liz Stringer and Leah Flanagan joining us for the entire tour. And uh, we'll have our brass players back as well for the rest of the tour as well, which we didn't have in Tassie. So it'll be the it'll be the, the full picture, the full band on stage. 
Leah was great at, at uh, Hunter Valley as well. And uh, I, I guess at this point, so it's your 13th and final you know, full-length album. Um, and this is your, your, your last tour as we know it. Um, any doubts at, the, at this stage? Are you thinking I, I, maybe you know, it's too soon or, or, or are, you, are you comfortable? No, I think, yeah, I think we're all comfortable with um, this being the last tour. Uh, we're a bit disappointed we can't get to WA at the moment and the Kiwi shows are a little bit up in the air as well. Might have to push them back a little bit later in the year. But we're determined to play to as many people as possible here and maybe overseas if we can get over there, you know, COVID willing. Um, we have um, fans in Europe and North America, Brazil, even South Africa, other places We'd love to get to. We're going to try to get to as many people as possible. But the the main game at the moment is to is to play to our Australian audience, some of whom, you know, saw the band dare I say it back in the late seventies, early eighties, a long time ago. Yeah, and um, this album, a lot of comparisons were made, um, certainly with the Macarada project and and this album too, where they're saying you know the. The Diesel and Dust era, uh, it was rather similar. You know, you went on that great tour, the Blackfella Whitefella tour, and you, you you went everywhere, and you came back, and then went into the studio for Diesel and Dust, and and this one, you came off the Great Circle tour, which was something like seventy seven shows, and you went around the world, and you even went to um, the I think it was was the Big Red Bash, and you, you did all that stuff, and then went in and recorded all these songs. Yeah, so um, it's a joy to get these songs finally out. I got to tell you, it's more than two years since we went into a studio in Sydney with our longtime producer, Warren Livesey, um, to do the 12 songs. Um, you know, last year we put out the Macarada Project. It was a mini album. And the reason we put that mini album out was that the songwriters in the band were all writing songs about um, First Nations issues, uh, songs of reconciliation and justice, and particularly focused on the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which is still languishing there. I mean, I've got to, I've got to tell you, mate, I mean, this government will talk until 5 a.m. about religious discrimination bills, but not a murmur about this amazing document, this foundation, this beautiful piece of poetry called The Voice, uh, the, the Uluru Statement from the Heart. That should be high on the agenda. But anyway, back to the point. Um, on that same recording session, we managed to not only finish the Macarada songs and release them last year, but finally we've got the Resist album coming out and 12 new songs and we're going to actually have them on rotation on the Resist tour. In other words, we're going to take a different three or four every night so people come and see us multiple times. We'll get to hear a bunch of new songs plus also the older songs on rotation. That's great because a lot of people may not have got to that tour last year, uh, you know, for travel reasons or, or whatever. And it was really special and, and um, you know, it was emotional. And, and as you said, you talked about the statement and that was on the, you know, the big screen behind you. And, and um, you know, as you heard the songs, you could read that and take it in. And I, I, I think uh, it'd be great to hear a few of these songs. And of course, all the, the powder workers and the Midnight Oil fans, they, they, they go to often multiple shows, as you know. Many will probably go to every show. Yeah, some will. Yeah, we already know they're going to do that. So it's important for us to mix, it, mix up the sets. And um, as I said, you know, Adam, um, our, our bass player, has um, just been every, I think every evening after rehearsals, he goes back, has, has dinner, and then he, uh, he gets stuck into new songs because we keep on, poor guy, we keep on throwing new songs. How about, you know, some kids or how about back on the borderline or how about no reaction or how about I'm the cure, you know. And he goes, oh, okay, and he's always incredibly amenable. Like, okay, sit, come in the next day and then we play it once. And because he's such a great mus- musician, uh, we can add the add these songs and mix it up. It's um, we, You know, we're really looking forward to it. That's fantastic. He's obviously got a great work ethic and uh, I, I don't think, um, you know, anyone can walk into Midnight Oil and expect to, to have an easy run. I mean, uh, that's a lot of songs and uh, you've got to have it nailed. And I've got to talk about your work ethic uh, because, uh, you know, you're, you're a fit bloke and, uh, you know, at the end of the show you give it everything and uh, I don't know how you do it, but... I have to ask you, though, because it is the ride of this podcast, I've got to ask you, what do you have in your esky behind the, the drum kit there? What, 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 do you, what do you have, say, during before and after the show? Well, it's very boring. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> I try to drink gallons of water before I go on because I'm, I, I sweat so much. Yeah. yeah. And um, I really feel it if I get hy- not hypothermic. Dehydrated, out. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If you get dehydrated, 
uh, I feel start to feel giddy and I might fall off the perch. <laughs> so so um, there's a few spots in the set where I might be able to sneak around the back and have another drink during the show um, and maybe even change one black T-shirt for another black T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so um, I think, I'm, you know, the, the shows are lasting average of two two hours to two and a half hours because we simply want to cover so much ground. And because it is our last tour, we're aware that there are favourite songs that people have come deliberately to hear and we want to get around to those as many as possible. So the song, the sets will be long and, yeah, we'll be knackered by the end of it. But on the basis of the gigs we've already done in Tassie and the rehearsals, I think the shows, hopefully, will be as strong and angry, I might add, as any oil shows that anyone's ever seen. Well, you timed it right. I mean, there's going to be obviously an election uh, around May at this stage, so you're, you're well and truly part of the run-in to, <laughs> to an election. So yeah, I think you've, you've got the dates locked in there pretty well. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, oh, God, don't, be, don't get me started on the election. I, yeah, mean, God, yeah. I mean, really, um, uh, look, um, as, you, as you know, um, Beko, because you've heard the album, um, a lot of the album is based around climate change and the, and the fact that this is the greatest existential challenge that we face. Yeah, yeah. But you wouldn't know it, you know, if you if you uh, looked at actually what the federal government uh, has been doing or not doing. I mean, after the embarrassment of the Glasgow summit, do you know only 10 days after that, uh, the largest liquid natural gas fossil fuel project off the Western Australian coast, the Scarborough project, was announced. And, you know, some people think that that's the equivalent of opening up to 15 new black coal mines. So is this our contribution, really? You know, yeah. is this, I mean, it's got to stop. The contributions to the fossil fuel industry from taxpayers has got to stop. And, you know, we're facing a barrier reef that probably over the summer suffered its third major bleaching event. So I don't know if you've ever been lucky enough to snorkel or dive around the reef, Becco, but yeah, I have. This, yeah. this isn't something that our kids or our grandchildren will have the opportunity to do and it's, and it's been on our watch that we've allowed this to happen and on our watch that although the Darling River, the Barker, as it's better known now, um, is full of water at the moment because of the La Nina event, only a few years ago millions of dying fish on that, you know, because of mm. water extraction. I mean, no one has been able to tell us yet why on the driest continent on earth during increasing drought and climate change we allow the most water intensive crops rice and cotton and almonds to extract that proportion of water from that river system yeah with the result that it becomes a dust bowl you know in, in majority of times it's yeah just- well we know about the cotton fields you know down the river arena and there's rice up in sort of northern darling up around there and and i oh know it's crazy it, it, it is crazy and, and- Growing up in the country, I've seen it, you know. So this, so this, so all of these things, of course, bleed into the songwriters mm. and our songs. And so, you know, that, that uh, also galvanises the live shows as well. As we play these, there'll be a certain amount of angst and venom that we'll bring to bear. You did Rock on the Reef um, five years ago now, I think it was, and that, that was an incredible gig. And, of course, famously, the Exxon building, uh, can we see come back and, and perform on the steps of, say, uh, well, you know, Parliament House or whatever down the track for special moments. Yeah, obviously we can't give the the game away. But yeah, we, <laughs> no. Otherwise, um, otherwise they'll lock uh, you out. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. They'll put an electric fence around wherever we are. But um, yeah, expect to, expect us to pop up somewhere. Yeah, down the track. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that um, that protest. You know, we went out there on that atoll off the far north. Queensland coast and uh, it's an atoll that only dries briefly, you know, during the low tide and we went out there and put that banner up and that got international interest um, around the world. I don't think people were aware um, that the reef was in such peril and the government, I mean, Susan Lee, she went around the world uh, trying to convince folks recently not to put the Great Barrier Reef on the endangered list. I mean, endangered, it's nearly dead for God's sake. You know, why would they bother to cover up something like that? Why would why wouldn't they immediately address the situation, and and stop allowing um, the Carmichael Basin and Scarborough and the Browse Basin and all the other massive fossil fuel projects? 
We've yeah. got to do our bit. You know, I mean, people say, oh, it's only, Australia only contributes a tiny percentage to the problem. But Newcastle is the biggest coal export port in the world. So we export the problem overseas. And, and all the way up the, the Queensland coast as well. That's but, right, into, into Gladstone. That's yeah, right. into Gladstone. Uh, look, changing tack now, because uh, there's something I've always wanted to ask you, uh, well, at least since the last interview, and it's a story someone told me oh, literally only about a year ago, but Paul Hester did a prank on you uh, at one of your gigs many, obviously many, many years ago. Uh, Paul Hester from Crowded House. He was in the barrel next to your drum kit. The tank. And, and in, in the tank, can you tell me about this? Because I've never heard this story from you. Oh, so I can't actually remember the gig, Becca, but um, it definitely did happen. Um, Crowdies happened to be in town, wherever it was, at the same time as the oils, some overseas port. And um, Paul, of course, knew that I used to um, use the water tank as part of the drum solo in Power and Passion. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and um, so... I think we must have been playing Power and Passion and halfway through the song I'm aware that there's someone else playing along. <laughs> <laughs> I look around and it appears to be it appears to be someone inside my water tank. And then, and then and then as I'm looking around I see Paul's head come up <laughs> above the tank. <laughs> that beautiful cheeky face of his and he's playing somehow man, the crew managed to get him up inside the tank without me noticing. And so he played the solo from inside the tank. Oh, that's amazing. And that's, that's, that's commitment, by the way, as well, because he's obviously waited through probably most of the show. <laughs> and it's probably hot in the tank as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's, he, he did quite a few favours. Once, um, once I was really crook and I couldn't play a show in Adelaide and Hesse was down there. Hesse came and actually played the show, poor guy, and... Um, um, you know, Crowdies play more of a pop show and um, Paul was a fantastic drummer. So it was probably a bit unfair to, you know, to make him play two hours with a kind of intensity. Yeah. But I went and saw him the next morning at the at the hotel in Adelaide and uh, knocked on his door and, and he was sitting on the bed and he had the whole bed was covered with bandages. <laughs> he, was, he was taping up all the fingers on both hands that were, he'd lost skin, actually, such was his commitment to finishing that show. So what an amazing guy. That's amazing. And, and, and deep down you were like, yeah, that's what it takes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of schadenfreude. That's <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. So you, you've done some big gigs. I mentioned Exxon before and, of course, you know, Goat Island I think is one of the most iconic moments, um, you know, oils on the water. And, and even Armistice Day, one of the most recent ones um, at the Domain, um, what – is the all-time greatest gig in your head after oh. all these years? Oh, God. Um, oh, so many, Becca. Yeah. Uh, it's a real tough one because it's a lot of years of touring and often, uh, you know, touring up and down the pubs as well and, and it's hard to narrow it down. But Midnight Oil spent quite a lot of time in Europe and we've got strong audiences in Germany, France, Holland, Sweden, Switzerland, Belgium, blah, blah, blah. but we hardly ever went to the East. But on that tour, uh, we went to, um, a few years back, we went to a place called Ostrava, which is in the Czech Republic, and it's way over near the Polish border. And we played to an audience that I think many of them had never seen the band, they'd heard about the band, they might have got hold of our albums. And, um, and the gig was actually in a decommissioned old uh, industrial plant steel steel works but it was all rusting and it actually looks like a midnight oil film clip it was perfect you know um and um and we were on at dusk and the perfect spot just just at sundown and uh we only had an hour like you know it's all you ever get on a european festival show there's a bit of footage of it somewhere but it's it's one of those nights where it was just quite a moment it was a moment of epiphany for the band to play after all these years, to an Eastern Europe audience, Eastern European audience, and for people that have been waiting for so many years, decades even, for us to actually make the journey that far east. And um, and I remember coming off stage and Pete and I looking at each other going, yeah, that was something. And so that that's one that comes to mind. But there's there's others. You know, there's the moment of the time that we first managed to play in South Africa at the end of apartheid. Oh wow! Yeah, 
because our albums we'd, we'd actually boycotted South Africa and and um, restricted the sale of our albums during the apartheid period in South Africa. But um, I think apartheid ended uh, 93, 94 there, and we went. Uh, but prior to that, we'd been invited, but you had to go and play at Sun City or one of those terrible places, and we refused to do that. So we, by the time we got there, there was this amazing spirit in the air in South Africa, and we played three shows. We played in uh, Durban, Cape Town, and Johannesburg. And the Johannesburg show was particularly amazing because um, the, the organisers had bust in a whole lot of folks from the townships, from Soweto and elsewhere. And so it was a huge... Uh, mixed audience that uh, knew all the songs, sang a lot better than us, i got to add. You know, amazing. <laughs> you know, wow. I mean, South, Af- South Africans can sing. Yeah, yeah. Once again, it's captured on film. It's out there somewhere. But um, we had Charlie McMahon on Didgeridoo there, and uh, he used to have this thing where he'd send firecrackers from the edge of his didgeridoo into the crowd. <laughs> no way. Uh, but the South, Af- South African cops thought that someone was shooting at the stage, so they all drew, and so we thought, oh, well, great, we're going to be shot. But... Um, uh, Incredible lineup. Do um, you remember Johnny Clegg? He's no longer with us, but incredible South African performer and dancer. He was on the bill, uh, as was Sting. So it was an incredible oh, afternoon wow. of music. And and uh, so that, that's another one which, you know, really was something. So, you know, you got some incredible uh, local acts on on your tour this time around, you know, supporting. And one thing that's one thing you all have always done is, is lift up those uh, very deserving young artists. Um, but is there still someone you want to have on the bill with you that you can't quite get? Is, is there someone even internationally that you've, you'd love to perform with? I mean, like Sting? Yeah, yeah, it'd be great to have Springsteen and the E Street Band support us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I know you're a fan, you know. <laughs> yeah, unlikely. I met um, drummer Max Weinberg from the E Street Band on the, on the last Springsteen tour and um, – they're all, and I met them all, as such lovely people, apart from being great musicians. I mean, they've been around for longer than us even and, um, you know, they've done everything and and they're very strong politically, as you know. They're on the side of the angels and Max was so accommodating. He, he, in the sound check, he said, come and play the drum, my drums. And I went up and played his beautiful DW drum kit up there and sits way up high above the band and... So, yeah, they can support us anytime, but I'm more likely we would support them, I would say. Well, I've got regrets too. I, I went to Little Stevens gig, uh, I don't know, like three years ago, and, and, yeah. and I didn't know Pete was coming up towards the end of the show, and, and it, was, it was one of those days I think I just had a you know, long day, and, I, and I, I got to about three quarters of the way through the gig, and I went, you know what, I better call it the night. I've got to go home. And I log on the next morning and find out that, that Pete has taken the stage with little Stephen on stage. It would have been just amazing. And so they must have done Sun City, which of course little little Stephen produced all those years ago as an anti-apartheid anthem. Yeah, right. It featured in the film clip and the song. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, there you go. So that would have been, I imagine that's the song they would have done. I, I wanted to ask you about the Antler at Narrabeen right at the beginning of the band. Um, and if you go to any Oils fan, that's the time they always talk about, you know, the sweaty beer garden, uh, the condensation dripping from the roof. What what made that era so special? Oh, that was the age of the sticky car- carpet cowboys. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> um, there just didn't seem to be any regulations back then. I mean, people would have licences for venues and then they'd put in ten times the number. And no one seemed to worry too much, you know. Um it was quite gladiatorial. Uh, there's a good book by Mark Seymour, 13 Time Theory, he talks about it, how, you know, all the bands of that era, the late 70s and 80s, had to get bigger and bigger PAs because as the pub crowds got bigger and bigger, it was a question of who would win and, you know, the Christians or the Lions. And um, so we ended up carting around these huge PAs and got really loud. We were on the same circuit. And I must say it was... It was a fantastic circuit to be on, that late 70s, early 80s circuit, along with bands like uh, Rose Tattoo and Cold Chisel, The Angels, uh, My Sex, Dragon, Mentals, um, Jimmy and the Boys. There was this, and, you know, we would never see, as musicians, we would never see all those musicians until years later because we were always in a different port at a different time, you know. Would have, yeah, of course. But but that's all that anyone ever, I mean, punters, that was before dance music, that's before fire and noise regulations closed all these amazing beer barns down. And that's where all these bands learned to play, you know, in the wake of Akadaka, who were kind of our heroes 
starting out, you know, and uh, that's why bands, when like ourselves, when we finally did go overseas, we were so kind of road tough and put on these really strong live shows. Now, um, do you feel like this is the perfect way to wrap up the band as as we know it? I mean, especially with the loss of Bones, which obviously came as a shock for all of us. Yeah, we miss we miss Bones terribly um, as a person, as a musician, and as an incredible vocalist singer. In many ways, this album and tour is dedicated. Well, it's dedicated to Bonesy. It's the last album he played on yeah. before we lost him. And I think that he would appreciate the fact that we're going out finally to play these songs that he he recorded with us um, two years ago, going out and playing them live. So it's a it's a tribute to him in a way. This tour, um, but we also, always, um, I guess we we never want to be one of those bands that that just sort of just kept on playing the old material, the hits, you know, we know that it works and we know everyone's waiting for those songs. And don't get me wrong, we will be playing a lot of back catalogue and well-known songs, but we also didn't want to be a band that went out without new material. You know, we wanted to be re- we want to be still tough and relevant. And the songs I think are, are and I think people will really enjoy the new album. Um, there are a few slower songs, but even the slow, slower songs are very tightly wound. They're... They're a lot full of tension and anger and uh, we're not going softly into the night, that's for sure. Was it, Is Lucky Country the, the, the one where he does the, the, the vocal solo? One Country, yeah. One, one Country. And, and, and when that came on, um, I, I shed a tear because I, I think the, you know, that, that, that's the moment of, a, of, of me saying goodbye to him in the crowd and um, I'm really glad you guys are using this, this tour as, as a goodbye to him but also a goodbye to the, the fans as well. They've been there since the, the Antler at Narrabeen and... Uh, uh, you know, I think everyone's very excited. Impossible to place, re- replace Bonesy, but we have Liz and Leah um, doing all of Bonesy's difficult harmonies. I used to have Bonesy really loud in my wedge and I would always tune to him because every night he would hit the note right on without fail, never out of tune. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's fantastic. And they do the same. So we, we're, um, we're covering that area because apart from being, um, you know, a loud guitar band, we're also... We've also got all these strong harmonies and things that we have in our music. Yeah, you do. And you can't, and you can't do without those. Well, look, it's, it's been a journey, and, and people use that term a lot, but it really has been. Uh, and uh, we're very excited to have the album out, uh, the 13th and final album, Resist, from uh, Midnight All. Rob Hurst, thanks so much for your time, and I can't wait to catch up again soon. Yeah, same, Becco. Thanks for the interview, mate. Talk soon. Well, there he is, Rob Hurst, the drummer of Midnight Oil, and you feel that this is going to be a one huge tour. There's definitely more to come. There's going to be international dates coming through, and I think there's going to be one huge finale for those uh, likely to be in Sydney. So uh, there's a lot to come for Midnight Oil on this final tour. And, of course, go and get the album. It's a celebration of Bones Hillman. It's a celebration of the band. Midnight Oil, and go back and check out the track-by-track with Pete Garrett and Rob Hurst on Spotify only. Just search for The Rider Pod on Spotify. And, of course, click subscribe. Love to have you back next week. We've got a special guest who's coming down under for the first time in quite a while. And, in fact, international bands are starting to make some announcements about touring this year. And Under the Southern Stars is definitely happening this March. And we can't wait. Next week on the podcast, Gavin Rostow from Bush. This is The Rider with Becco. Catch you then.